Mark was on his way to his psychologist for another appointment. He was tired of people saying he was deluded, not believing him. He saw weird things more and more lately, but what frustrated him so much was no one believing him. He knew what he saw was real. He reached the building and went inside and took the elevator to the third floor where his psychologist had his office. While he was in the elevator, he was thinking of what to tell his psychologist this week. In the office, Mark's psychologist spoke. Oh Mark, don't worry. We are going to get to the bottom of this. We just need to find out a few things about what happened in your past that might be causing these breaks in reality. I am going to show you a few drawings, and I would kindly appreciate if you told me what you saw in them, please. Mark's psychologist held up the first photo, and Mark looked at it for a few seconds, then said, I see a dragon. Then he held up another. And what do you see in this one, please, Mark? Mark yet again took another few seconds to look at it, and then said, Some kind of alien. Mark was getting impatient with this exercise he saw many times in the movies and he often wondered what it was in aid of. It was like it was just trying to find out was the person crazy and he knew he wasn't crazy, he knew he saw what he saw. The only thing is, why doesn't anyone believe him? He felt like if someone just believed him, maybe they would go away. His psychologist held up another photo. Mark took longer this time, and then said, It's obviously a gun. His psychologist smiled and said, OK Mark, this is going to take a while to sort out, but I can guarantee you that what you see is not real, and that's for sure. Thirty minutes later the session had ended, and Mark had left the building. His psychologist felt strange. He felt kind of faint. Then he froze in fear, when he saw a dragon fly into the room. Then what looked like an alien came into the room. He screamed out in horror, but before his receptionist could come into the room to see what was wrong, a gun floated in the air over to his head, and then the gun went off. When the receptionist came into the room, she screamed and called the police telling them he had shot himself in the head. Mark wondered why his psychologist killed himself, but he was relieved. His visions had stopped. Jack was a criminal into all sorts of criminal activity. He was in court for so many different crimes. He spent 10 years in prison, but since he was released, he didn't get reformed, he just got better at not being caught for whatever crimes he committed. During his last court appearance, the judge had told him that if he keeps getting arrested, he will be put into prison for good. One night Jack was trying to rob a bank, but then it went horribly wrong and he ended up shooting a police officer. He knew it was the death penalty for capital punishment. While he was waiting on death row, there were several groups against the death penalty and wanting to ban it outright. He sat in prison writing and writing about his feelings, trying to pass the time. He had no access to the internet or newspapers, but still found out about the groups that were pushing for the death penalty to be banned. It was a prison warden on death row told him the first day it was finalised he would not be getting the death penalty. 
he would not be sentenced to death. He was relieved, but then felt even sicker, knowing he would be locked up in a prison for years and years until he finally died. He wondered how he would stay sane. To his surprise, one day, a man in a suit opened his cell and said to him, Hello Jack, my name is Terry. I am the head of New Beginnings. I am the leader of the group that has successfully banned the death penalty. You are the first person we are trying the alternate punishment out on. You just need to go through a quick operation and then you are free to go out into the outside world. Jack couldn't believe his ears and knew there must have been a catch. The next day he was lying in a room with doctors all around him and when he woke up the doctor said, Hi Jack, your procedure is done and you are free to go. Jack asked what was the catch and they told him, You will see, but don't worry Jack, you won't be hurt and you won't ever get locked up again. When Jack left the room, None of the officers acknowledged him or said goodbye or good luck. When he was walking down the street, no one acknowledged him. It wasn't until he tried to make a phone call from when he was home, he found something strange. No matter what number he rang or text he tried writing, nothing happened. He knocked at his friend's door. There was no answer. Suddenly his friend's car pulled up in his driveway and Jack said, They set me free, but his friend didn't seem to hear him. He didn't see him. And then he knew. The new punishment for him not getting the death penalty was being immortal, invisible, and alone, with no chance of lifting an object to let anyone know he was there. He knew he was immortal because... There was a voice inside his head told him, but that voice told him that now that he knows he will be alone, it also told him no matter what he lifts, he will think he lifted it, he will think he opened doors, he will think he threw glasses if that's what he done, but to anyone else there will be no one or nothing there. Jack would be invisible alone and immortal. Thanks for coming along to another session, Mike. I wanted to speak to you about what is really getting under your skin today. I am going to try to get to the bottom of whatever it is, and we will be able to speak about whatever is bothering you and try to find out what the biggest fear you have or the biggest worry. We will really dig into your psyche and try to uncover secrets to make you feel much better in whatever you're going through and whatever is worrying you. Whether it's worry over money or relationship or guilt. Are you feeling comfortable? Is there anything I can get you? A glass of water? Maybe another cup of coffee? Yep, a cup of coffee would be great please thanks. Joe made some coffee and laid the cup on the table in front of Mike. Mike took a drink of coffee and then relaxed in his seat for his counselling session. So Mike, first I want to ask you, what do you think is making you feel uncomfortable this month? Well to be honest, I feel like I'm trying my best to better my life, in work etc. And I'm putting my work before my home and my wife and kids etc. I mean by the time I get home at night my kids are already in bed and I hardly ever take my wife out. Sometimes I feel like maybe if I made less money and had more time with my family I would be so much happier. Well Mike, I can see where you're coming from, 
but it's my job to make you unravel whatever is worrying you. So Mike, let's start at the start. You mentioned you're working too hard to spend time with your family. Could you explain more? Is that all it is? You working long hours to not spend time with your wife? Or is there something else? Well yes, that's it basically, and I wish I had more time with my family to spend with my wife and kids. That is one of the main reasons I came to see a counsellor. Oh Mike, I'm glad you came to see a counsellor, as I will tell you what you should do. You should be honest with your wife and kids. You should be loyal. Mike was getting a bit anxious. Joe kept talking. See Mike, what good is it you coming to counselling if you don't take note of the counsellor? You shouldn't be disloyal now, should you? Joe looked confused and said, That's okay, I just wanted to try it out as an experiment when you were so adamant you thought it would be a good idea to see what things would feel like if our roles were reversed. But I am your counsellor, so let's just keep it that way, please. Mike gave a sinister smile and said, Oh no, but you see, Mr. Counselor, I was enjoying playing the role of a counselor because I was just getting to the root of your problem, which as a matter of fact I just found out last week from reading my wife's text messages is my problem also. Joe stood up and said, Mike, our session is over, and to be honest, I'm sorry, but I think you might have to get a different counsellor. Mike said, No, Mr. Counsellor, I have finally discovered how to ease my pain. See, now that I know that you are having an affair with my wife, I just need to make that stop. Mike pulled out a gun and pointed it to Joe. Joe jumped in fright and said, Mike, I'm so sorry. I will never see your wife again. Trust me, you have to trust me. Mike said, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? You always used to tell me, trust my wife when I told you I was worried she was cheating. Well, I can't trust her, can I? And I shouldn't, should I? So I need to get rid of the problem. I need to get rid of you. Mike shot his counsellor in his head. Tracy was very upset after her husband went missing 20 years ago. Her husband Barry was only 30 when he disappeared. Tracy still used to sit crying, looking through photo albums of better times. She used to find it hard to look at photos of her and her husband, but she wanted to keep his memory alive. Tracy tried different techniques to contact her husband. She visited a psychic and even had a seance but nothing worked. Lately, she had a huge urge to dig a hole in her garden at a particular spot. She went out one day into the spot where she had the urge to dig and began digging. She didn't know where she was getting her energy from, but she kept on digging and digging and digging. It eventually got too dark, so she had to call it a day. The next morning she was out doing the same thing, digging and digging and digging, until eventually when she was over 30 feet down, she came across a door. She wondered what was the door doing over 30 feet underground. She turned the doorknob expecting it to be just the door stuck in the dirt, but to her surprise she opened it to a beautiful landscape. She thought she was dreaming, did a man that looked familiar stood in front of her and said, You bitch. Tracy couldn't believe her eyes, but knew that the man standing next to her was her husband Barry, who would now be 50. Then suddenly Tracy woke up, thinking what a strange dream. The first thing she'd done, even though she knew it was a dream, was go out to the garden where she dug the huge hole in the dream. Of course there was no hole, but she thought of something. What if she dug a little, not 30 feet, but just a little? 
She had the urge to dig, and she knew she was awake this time. A few minutes later she began digging. She hit something hard, and got a start. She bent down on her knees, and took away dirt, revealing a hand. Then it all came back to her, guessing the dream had unopened the repressed memory of her killing and burying her husband. Tony's grandfather was sick for months, and he was going more and more downhill. His grandfather was an alcoholic and still used to sip on his whiskey, even in his deathbed. Tony told his grandfather to give up the drink, but his grandfather said it made him happy and cope with his illness. Tony's grandfather took a turn for the worst one day, and the doctor was called. When the doctor was out of the room, Tony's grandfather said, I am so sorry, I have committed a horrible crime years and years ago. I wish I never did. Tony wondered whether to ask his grandfather what it was, and decided to give him the option of whether he wanted to tell him or not. Grandad, you know I love you, so you can tell me what it was if you like. Tony's grandfather said, I stole from your grandmom. I stole her life savings. I had a huge drink problem. Well, I still do, but I regretted stealing from your grandmom. Tony hated the idea of his granddad stealing from his grandmom, but he wasn't going to let anything turn him against his granddad on his deathbed. Suddenly, Tony's granddad said, That's not all. I made a spell to something happen in exchange for my freedom. When I pass away, you will have to run, run for your life. I asked my granddad what did he mean. He said, there will be a dark spirit. A few minutes later, Tony's granddad passed away peacefully. Suddenly, Tony heard a noise and turned around to see a dark figure that must have been the dark spirit his granddad warned him about. It was a summer's night in a downtown theater that five people were alone together in the theater. Alone, because they were rehearsing for a very, very dangerous magic trick for the next night. They acted everything out as if the theater had a packed house. Sam Days was a hugely popular magician and was trying a really elaborate trick. The trick was to give his helper a gun and to her shoot him and him catch the bullet in his mouth. And to make it harder, if he didn't catch it with his mouth, it would go straight through his mouth and out the back of his head, hitting a barrel of gasoline. The bullet was an expanding bullet, which meant it would penetrate his skull if he didn't catch the bullet. Sam's hostess, Sherry, was standing on the stage with him. The other three were in the audience watching. They would take part in other magic tricks after. Sam walked on the stage and said, Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you all to the wonderful world of magic. I am your host, Sam, and this is my beautiful helper, Sherry. For my first trick, tonight I am going to do a very, very dangerous trick. It is so dangerous that there have been several people killed from attempting it. I am going to put a twist to it even. 
I have a barrel full of gasoline put behind me, and Sherry is going to shoot me with a special bullet that expands. So if I don't catch this bullet with my mouth, it will be game over for me. And, well, you all better run for the hills, because it will go right through the barrel and cause a mighty big explosion. So, I'll just get on with the act, shall I? Sam smiled and gave a gun to Sherry, and walked back to stand in front of the barrel. Sam said, ready when you are? Sherry held up the gun and pulled the trigger. The bullet went through the air and everyone gasped when Sam couldn't catch the bullet and the barrel went up in flames. They all looked shocked with horror as Sam burned with it. Suddenly, before anyone could call the police, there was another gunshot and Sherry fell to the floor as someone had just shot her. Jack was sitting down waiting for his call and noticed Ginny and Patrick. The remaining two people were gone. He knew there were just five of them in the theater as they locked the door after entering, which meant the killer had to be either Ginny or Patrick, the only two remaining besides himself. Suddenly there was a noise behind him and he jumped up from his seat it was Ginny and Patrick. Patrick said, What in the name of God is there a fire for? Jack was so shocked he had forgotten all about the fire. Patrick ran up on the stage and fetched the fire hose to put the fire out. He had just seen Sherry lying down on the ground dead and screamed but ran over to put the fire out still. Jack said to Ginny, which one of ye killed Sherry? What the hell is happening? Ginny said, Sherry is dead. What the hell happened, Jack? Jack said, this is madness. I'm calling the police. He picked out his phone to call the police. He told them what had happened and to come fast. After a few minutes, finally, Patrick had the fire put out and saw the burnt body of Sam. He walked down to where Ginny and Jack were sitting. Jack said to Patrick, Where the hell were you? It could have been only either two of ye, the killer. Patrick said, Are you crazy? None of us killed anyone. There must be someone else in here. Ten minutes had passed, and the police hadn't arrived. Jack got up to walk up and down the theatre. Ginny whispered to Patrick, Something isn't right. I don't think he rang the police. Suddenly there was a shot, and Ginny screamed as Patrick was shot in the head. Ginny looked around, terrified, when she saw Jack run up to her and shout, What did you do? Ginny shouted, I didn't do anything. It was you who shot him. The police suddenly arrived, and Ginny told them everything that happened, and about Jack shooting him. She didn't see him shoot him, but it had to be him. There was no one else in the theatre. Jack was arrested, and after some investigation and speaking with the theatre's owner, they learned that the owner's jewellery worth $10 million had been stolen from his safe which was opened with his key. He told the police that Jack must have used some magic trick to retrieve the key from him. Sam Days was missed dearly by his fans, but little did they know he pulled off his biggest trick by staging his own death by falling down a trapdoor when the blast happened, knowing there was already a scorched body inside the barrel with gasoline. He didn't want to kill Sherry and Patrick, but had to as he stupidly told them about his fantasy about stealing the theatre's owner's key and open the safe and steal the jewellery and live the high life. He knew if he hadn't killed them, they would tell the police, and plus he knew now that Jack got all the blame, which suited him fine, as that sneaky Jack had tried to constantly best him in magic tricks, but now he won't ever be able to best them. Sam smiled, lying on a beach knowing. He finally pulled off his best magic trick, the ultimate disappearing act, his fake debt.